Hello and welcome to Embedded. I am Elicia White, here with Christopher White. This week, we have Julia Evans, creator of Wizard Zines, to talk to us about a lot of things, internet careers, and how numbers are represented. Before we talk to Julia, I have an open job rec, well, three of them actually, from Volta Labs, an MIT spinoff that is developing a novel lab automation platform for genome sequencing. They've raised $20 million as part of the Series A funding and are hiring for several roles related to embedded software. All roles are full-time, 100% on-site in Boston, and require the ability to thrive in an early-stage startup. You could be a senior firmware engineer, ARM-based microcontrollers, C and C++, RTOS, all those things, or tech lead of instrument software requires prior experience as a tech lead and strong programming in Python or Linux, or tech lead electrical and embedded systems, lead design and development of electrical systems and firmware. If you're interested in one of these jobs, check out Volta Labs. There'll be a link in the show notes. Hi, Julia. Welcome back. Hello. Thanks for having me again. It has been quite a while. What have you been up to? I've... How long has it been? I don't even know. Years. Years. Last time we talked to you, you uh, you had a normal job, I think, doing Django, but I'm not sure. Mm, well, it might have been machine learning. Maybe I was doing machine learning then. That sounds right. There's no way to know. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and now I spend a lot more time writing about programming and about things that I think are cool, um, like computer networking, um, and right now numbers, and how computers represent numbers. Badly. Yeah, (laughs) badly. (laughs) They do their best. All right, so we're going to talk more about computer representation of numbers, and also how you have changed your career and all of the other things you've been working on. But first, we want to do lightning round, where we ask short questions. We want short answers until we say how and why and all the things we do when we misbehave. Are you ready? Yes. What is your favorite number? 42. Hmm. What is your favorite floating point number? Maybe 1.0. How many bytes do we really need? 64. No, 8. Uh... Do you complete one project or start a dozen? Uh, both. (laughs) What comics did you or do you read that kind of inspire your zine work? Um, Understanding Comics. Uh, Oh, that's a great book. I have that book. Yeah. Any others? I just read Ducks by Kate Beaton, which was great. Everyone, I think, is inspired by XKCD. Yeah. (laughs) If you could teach a college course, what would you want to teach? Uh, An intro to Linux and C programming. And the question we always have to ask, what is your favorite fictional robot? And it doesn't have to be the same as last time. I'm going to go with Wally because that's the one I saw most recently. All right. So you create zines, which isn't a word. (laughs) It's part of a word. It's a word. <laughs> what are zines? Uh, so they are, I think of them maybe as tiny self-published books. Uh, mine are usually like 28 pages, uh, often with uh, low production values, and uh, which no one can stop you from making. And this is your career now? That's right. That Now it is. <laughs> Which is a weird thing. Were you surprised that you ended up here? Yeah, I I didn't expect it. It's something that happened. Yeah, it's definitely something that happened that I didn't know what was going to happen. Um, what? Which of your zines are the most popular? Um, I, 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 don't, I don't keep track. Uh, I think in general, usually, I, I've... Most of them are about specific technical topics, like, you know, like how DNS works or how containers work. 
Um, and a couple of them are about more general topics that could apply to anyone, like the like help I have a manager um, or about debugging. And I think the ones that are not about a specific topic tend to be maybe a little more popular because they could be for anyone. And you have zines that are longer and then you have comics, which are like one page. That's right. Uh, are these pages of the zine or are they separate? They're usually pages of the zine. So, sometimes they're not. Yeah. Like sometimes I'll just write something that's like a one-off. Um, and, and often they change. <laughs> like I'll edit them, you know. But they're they're usually pages of, of, of the zine. I saw the one on uh, how to have a one-on-one with your manager, which was pretty amusing because it's so often people think that having a one-on-one is your manager telling you what to do. And if it is, then you're doing it wrong. That's right. <laughs> uh, that's that's your opportunity to ask all your questions. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like it's really something that, 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 that you should be driving. Um, and it's also not, not a status report, right? It's not like here, here's a list of all the things I did. Yeah. I mean, sometimes that's part of it, but that's true. That's kind of one of the smaller pieces. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And you're working on a zine now about number representation. Yeah. Um, and about how like the way that computers do math is kind of weird, not how you would intuitively expect, uh, especially with, with decimal numbers. Uh, I, I, it's been a bit surprising to write it because I think when I started, I was like, oh, you know, like math on computers isn't that weird. It's just math. And then the more, <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's, it's okay. And then the more I wrote about it, I was like, oh yeah, this is quite weird. Like no one, I think would, you wouldn't reasonably expect that it works this way. Uh, How hard could it be? All computers can do is add and, and will add. Basically. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they can d- divide <laughs> too. Well, <laughs> given enough time. Um, but yeah, it's actually really cool. And, and, and especially with, uh, with floating point numbers, with decimal numbers, which I think are, are known, known to be very weird. Uh, like when you, when you add like 0.1 and 0.2, you get uh, like 0.3, I don't remember the exact number of zeros, but like you don't get 0.3, you know? And I think that that's very upsetting to people when they first learn about it. Okay, so why? I mean, why wouldn't you get, I mean, if I have it in integers Mm -hmm. and I add one plus two, I get integer three. You do, yeah. So the the, the way that I like to think about it um, is that you have uh, 64 bits uh, or maybe maybe 32, but let's say 64 bits um, for, for, for your floating point number, right? And so you can kind of think of these, like, so you have two to the power of 64 numbers, and then you have all of the numbers from negative infinity to infinity. And so you have to think about those like two to the 64 numbers kind of scattered, right? <laughs> Somehow along the number line. And there's only so many of them. And so they have little spaces between them, right? Uh, you have like, let's say 1.0. And then after 1.0, you have uh, another number, which is like uh, a, a little bit more than 1.0. Uh, but it's not, you're, you're missing almost all the numbers, right? <laughs> well, wait a minute. If I have an infinite number line negative infinity to positive infinity yeah and i have 64 bits which i'm not going to name the the string of numbers that results (laughs) to 64 bits yeah but couldn't i have two to the 64 to the 64 numbers and then each one would effectively be integers but that's valid because (laughs) okay so (laughs) i have an infinite number line yeah. Yeah. Or and you have just the real numbers between zero and one, which is also a problem. Yeah. Let's go with the infinite number line because <laughs> I'm going to multiply some big numbers. Okay. And I have two to the 64 as my, as the total samples of the number line I can have. That's right. Okay. If I want to cover the value, the number of two to the 64, mm-hmm. then I want to also cover four to the 64. Mm-hmm. I can, I can generate numbers. It, it's infinite. I can generate so many numbers <laughs> that title <laughs> you, you can't represent it because infinity means I can have yes an infinite number. I guess that's really, that's a, 
Yeah. <laughs> Tautology. Um, okay. So I do think about it as sampling on yeah. the number line. Yeah. Yeah. Like we're, we're picking certain numbers that we're like, okay, these are the ones that we're going to work with. And it's not evenly distributed, right? And th- like, that's right, right. That's what I was headed for. Yeah, yeah they're not, they're, evenly, they're not distributed. evenly distributed, right? There, there's spaces between these numbers. And the bigger the numbers get, uh, the bigger the spaces are. Uh, so between, because who needs those? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think I think it's a little bit intuitive, right? Like like if we're talking about um, like the reason uh, we invented floating point was for science, right? And if we're talking about like the weight of an electron, or if we're talking about the um, like the distance, like the, to like the nearest star or something, like you don't need if you're talking about like something that's like two billion light years away, you don't need so much accuracy, right? 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 It's reasonable that the the the, the the distance between however much like two billion light years is in meters and the next number is, is quite large. Um, whereas wait, if you're talking, no, it's mm-hmm. two billion light years and three centimeters. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, like for those two quantities, you want different. Um, you 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 want more accuracy around three centimeters, right, than around two billion light years. Right. So you want the gaps between your numbers to be smaller. And so the the value between zero and one is, is well representative. Right. Well, so between zero and one, there's actually, uh, there, there's as many numbers between zero and one as there are between one and infinity, uh, which is kind of interesting. I mean, mentally just, uh, I mean, in floating point. <laughs> yes, no, yes, of course. Um, but that's, it's, it's, it's a weird thing. It's weird. <laughs> Um, yeah. So, so between, uh, every, every like successive pair of powers of two, so let, let's say between one and two, you have like two to the power of 52 numbers. And then between 0.5 and one, you also have two to the power of 52 numbers. And then between a quarter and a half, you also have two to the power of 52 numbers. So you have these like, these little like windows between every power of two and every one of those windows has the same number of floating point numbers in it. Does that make sense? Yeah. As you get closer to zero, like you said, you want, you more granularity. Those are, those are places you're going to be working with smaller and smaller differences between numbers. And you, yeah. I, I guess the choice was to make those more and more densely populated as you got closer to zero. Right. Like if you're between like two to the minus 57 and two to the minus 58, like you also want to have a lot of granularity there. So there's kind of the same num- amount of numbers between two to the minus 57 and two to the minus 58 as there are between one and two. And that, that seems like it kind of fell out of a natural way to represent numbers in binary too right because right the way it's split can you describe how it's split up because i i'm how, how it's split up in binary yeah. totally um so there's 64 bits um one bit is the sign right plus or minus really simple um and then the other one so so, so i talked about uh how, how you have these windows right between like one and two um so 11 of those bits tell you which window you're in. So they tell you like, okay, you're between one and two, or you're between two and four, or you're between four and eight. Um, so we call that the exponent. It's like which power of two you're at, right? Or you're, be- right. you're between like two to the 57 and two to the 58. Um, so those 11 bits give you, give you the exponent. And that that number is between, it's basically between two to the minus 1023 and two to the plus 1023. Um, so it's a very, very large range. Uh, and, and two to the 10. 1023. I think I, I, I was calculating this and I was like, well, I think like maybe two to the 128 is like the distance, to like a very far away galaxy. Um, so two to the 1023 is a really shocking number. Uh, I'm not really sure if there's anything uh, that's useful to us that's that big. Um, and similarly, two to the minus 23, I think is a really shockingly small number, that is smaller than anything that I could I could figure out. Um, but anyway, so 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 eleven bits tells you um, which what range you're in, right? It's like okay, you're between like sixteen and thirty two, and then the rest of the bits, the remaining fifty two bits, tell you where you are inside that range. So um, th- basically, the way it works is, let's say you're, you're between sixteen and thirty two, you have two to the power of fifty two steps, right, in between six. 16 and 32. And so it's just like, how many of those steps are you taking? So if it's zero, it's uh, going to be 16. And then if it's like two to the 52 minus one, you're going to be like almost at 32, but not quite like one tiny step before that. Okay. So one of the important things you said was two to the 1024. Yeah. And 1024 is 10 bits. And then you, you mentioned two to the 52. Yeah. So now I have 10 plus 
52. So now I'm up to 62. Yeah. And then plus or minus is one. So that's 63. Right. The, the other bit is it's, it's um, 1024 to minus 1024. So it's actually uh, 2048. So it's 11 bits. Oh, 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 right. You have to add those. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. And all of this explains why when you include floating point printf in your embedded code, <laughs> your code size explodes because to figure out how to print any of these things is, is probably a, quite a bit of code. Yeah, the, the the printing out of floating point numbers is a is a is a messed up thing, uh, which is kind of weird because you think of printing as being easy, uh, but the thing is, well, the weird thing about printing, wow, um, is like let's say you have the number zero point one, right? Um, so uh, fl- floating point is all binary, uh, like so, and zero point one is not an exact number in uh, like. So it, the, the the floating point number that's closest to 0.1 is, let's say, like, I don't know, let's say it's like 0.1000127. It's something that isn't 0.1, right? Um, but no one, like, if you print out 0.1, people don't want to see that, you know? <laughs> like, I think they probably want to see 0.1, even though it's a lie. Like, well, it's not a lie, it's rounded, right? Um, so, like, people want the computer to round to the, to the right number. Um, but also you can't kind of round to a... Like if you just round to eight decimal places or something, you're gonna get the wrong. Uh, you can get misleading answers because they're uh, so like 64 bit floating point numbers give you about 16 decimal places of precision, um, and so if you round to like let's say eight decimal places, uh, you could have two different numbers that print out as the same thing. Does that make sense? Yes. But they aren't equal. But but they aren't equal. So what what you want is like you want your printing algorithm uh, to. Like, to only print numbers the same if they're actually the same number, right? But you also want to make them as short as possible so that... And then it turns out that actually doing that, there's academic papers about it, um, which is why it's a lot of code. And this also brings up a common mistake that people make uh, with, like, unit tests and stuff. Mm. Or or tests for anything. It's like, oh, are these floating point... You know, I'm doing something in floating point. Are these equal? Does X equal 3.1? Right. Or right. does X equal Y? And it's like, well... Maybe they never, quote, equal each other. And so that yeah. test is never going to work. You have to have some tolerance. You have to have the epsilon. Does yeah. it equal this within epsilon, which is just so ugly. Yeah. Yeah. And then probably what you want to choose for epsilon is, like, if you think about, like, what's the gap between that floating point number and the next one, you probably want to scale your epsilon relative to that gap. Right. Oh, that's a good point. I think but I then, always just choose something stupid. <laughs> I, I, I honestly would also choose something stupid. But if I were to do something smart. You have to know where you are in those floating point windows. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it depends on the size of the number. Probably what epsilon you want to choose. You already talked about this, but I'm I'm looking at the zine and I had a, a problem. I, I hadn't like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Two to the minus 10, 23. Yes. A hydrogen atom weighs two to the minus 76 grams. Right. What are the scientists doing that they need two to the 1023, two um, to the minus 1023? I think like, they do. That's, 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 that's not even an angstrom. Yeah. Actually, I have no idea. Uh, I, I think the Planck length is, is much, yeah. Yeah, I think the, the Planck that, length so. is much, much larger than that. <laughs> um, I, I think I think it's less about kind of like the absolute sizes of the numbers that you can represent and more about wanting more accuracy. Like like the reason you go for a 64-bit float instead of a 32-bit float is not to get more range, um, but it, it's to get... So I, I said that um, with uh, 64-bit floats, you get about 16 digits of accuracy. Mm-hmm. Um, with floating with 32-bit floats, you get eight digits, um, which if you think about it, like let's say you're trying to represent an integer... Uh, which people sometimes do with floats, and that's okay. That means once you get to 10 million, let's say, right, 10 million is about eight digits, then uh, 10 million plus one is going to be like 10 million and two. Right. You know? Um, like, you, you start, or, well, I guess it's really going to be, but like the, 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 the number after, I think for 10 million, that's not true, but maybe for like 90 million, it's true. Like the number after 90 million is 90 million and two. Uh, so you start running into some like very severe accuracy problems. So you you literally add one to a number, yeah, x plus one, yeah, and then you check and it's plus two, yeah, because... or, or or worse, it's plus zero, 
and you haven't gone right. anywhere. Uh, on the biggest window, the the ten twenty four, yeah, two to the ten twenty four. You compared it to the furthest galaxy we know is about two to the ninety meters away, right? So we can measure the distance to the furthest galaxy in whatever angstroms, <laughs> 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 but but we can't we can represent it, but we can't represent it accurately because we don't have the yeah. resolution. It goes back to ten Your billion and three accurate, centimeters, probably within you know. But it's, you probably have enough accuracy, like. But it's fake accuracy. Because it's real accuracy, it's just not accurate accuracy. It's real resolution. <laughs> but 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 I think this is how um, um, scientific measurements usually work, right? Like like you you talk, you always talk about significant figures, and I think. I'm not a scientist, but my understanding is that you very rarely have 16 significant figures um, for for any measure, measurement. Um, it's really more than you would ever reasonably have. Though I'm sure some scientist is listening to this and is like, "You're." Uh, I, rem- I remember getting <laughs> yelled at in in the physics lab for, you know, you plug stuff into a calculator and and and, and do your or, or physics homework as well. Where yeah. Stuff where there were numbers involved, you know, everyone would do it on a calculator these days or on a computer, and you know, computer or Excel spits out you know, a billion, a yeah. billion significant figures. And yeah, that, that was a common, a common mark off is like, nope, you don't, these aren't real. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like in science, we don't have unlimited precision, right? Um, it doesn't, it doesn't exist in science. So you mentioned that 32 bits only has eight bits of precision and eight, eight, eight decimal places, eight decimal places. Uh, yeah. About. Yeah. It, right. Eight des not eight bits. That's, that's different. Um, eight eight decimal places of precision, and that's yeah okay. So, I saw on Mastodon <laughs> that you asked why would anybody want to use thirty two bit floats, mm. and some people mentioned that they still did. Mm. <laughs> oh, there's sixteen bit floats. Oh yeah, no sixteen. That's true. I, I, I use floats quite commonly. I've heard are very are very popular, especially in machine learning now. Yep. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I think I usually work in a like I don't do a lot of super high performance computing. So for me, I'm like, well, I have one float or two, so I might as well make them 64 bits. Right. Because uh, I'm, I'm not. I'd rather have the the extra the extra accuracy. Um, what kind of pushback did you get for the 32 bit comment? Wow, I I don't remember. Sorry, I would need to look. I don't really remember. Uh, I don't remember. I didn't look at the thread. I only saw the the comment and then later the retraction. <laughs> um, oh no, this was about integers. It wasn't oh, about okay. floats. Oh really? I think if it was oh, recent, more it was than two to the thirty-two integers. Was, That's was, just silly. It was. It was about <laughs> integers. Um. Well, okay, we could talk about integers, though. Sure. So I can tell you what I was saying. I, I made kind of a, like uh, what I thought was a funny comment. <laughs> and then people didn't like it because it wasn't true, uh, which, well, it wasn't true. <laughs> so it's very fair. Um, uh, let's see. So we're talking about how 32 bits is not a lot. And we were just talking about how for floats, you only get eight, eight decimal digits of accuracy and how that's sort of not very much. Um, but for, for integers... Um, so the biggest uh, 32-bit integer is, well, it's like 2 to the power of 32 minus 1, which is about uh, about 4 billion, right? It's just a, just a little more than 4 billion. Um, and it turns out that 4 billion is not that big of a number a lot of the time. Um, so, so for example, uh, IPv4 addresses are 32 bits, and it turns out we have more than 32 billion computers on the internet, Right. We um, ran out of those in 1999. We ran out of those in 1999. <laughs> and I'm sure people thought that 4 billion was plenty. Um, well, but, we have more than 4 billion humans on the planet. Well, exactly, right? Um, or uh, registers, like the, the way we store memory addresses and registers used to be 32 bits, right? We used to have 32-bit computers, which could only have up to 32 billion bytes of memory. But, uh, sorry, up to 4 billion bytes of memory, um, which is 4 gigabytes. But we... You can't live with four gigabytes of memory anymore, you know, on, on your laptop, I think. 
Um, you and I live in a very different world. <laughs> I do. Your your computer has. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> the things but you work on may not. The things I think about <laughs> are all thirty two bit. Yeah, but uh, but on, on our on our computers we won't want more than that. Uh, yeah. Um, or or like a Unix timestamps. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, oh, yes. Um, I'm looking actually, forward to that. Uh, are actually si- signed integers a lot of the time. And so you only get 2 billion seconds after uh, 1970 is going to be 2038. Um, and I'm sure people thought that that was plenty, you know, like 2 billion seconds. But then 2 billion seconds, it turns out, I guess, is what? Like 68 well, years. I mean, to, <laughs> to be fair, when people wrote that code, they, they were not thinking people would be using it, you know, 100 years later. No. That's just, just, that's just wrong. <laughs> Nobody should be using my code in 50 years or five. (laughs) And yet I am looking forward to learning Fortran to help some folks fix that bug. Fortran. And COBOL. You think it's all COBOL? Well, I mean, I think it's primarily C, but I think once we start an industry of fixing that bug. And then then everybody will just be rust people. We'll be the (laughs) the old crusty C people who know how to fix it. We're already the old crusty C people. (laughs) Okay. Sorry. Um, so, so what, what, what I wanted to say was that people should just be wary of using 32-bit integers by accident because um, a lot of older systems, um, like, for example, like in MySQL, integer is 32 bits. Um, so you don't, if you want to be careful using a, the default integer in case it's 32 bits and that's not what you want. It isn't just seconds since 1970. Um, a lot of times in an embedded systems, in an embedded system, you have milliseconds since boot. Mm. And then, and I mean this, okay, milliseconds since boot, that's, that's a lot of milliseconds. It doesn't matter. Until your system starts having 49 day issues. Why would you have anything on for 49 days? <laughs> exactly. But on day 49, something weird happens and your system reboots, which is fine because now everything's perfect. But then on day 98, something weird happens. (laughs) And so this 32-bit thing is, is, it's not a theoretical future one second since 1970 problem. Right. It's a very common embedded system problem. Uh, What made you decide that this was the subject for a zine? Hmm. I wanted to write about so I'm always interested in topics that are very fundamental and that, that don't change, right? Um, and so I was thinking about, and it was very meaningful to me when I kind of when I learned about how things were represented in binary on my computer, like about what all the bits meant. And so I wanted to write about, you know, what what do all 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 the bits mean in your uh, computer's memory? And then I started writing about uh, how numbers work, how integers and floats work, and then. I found out that that was the whole zine. Uh, like there wasn't space for anything else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so then I renamed it to How Integers and Floats Work. I, you do cover hexadecimal and bases and, and binary uh, operations. Yeah, yeah, I do. How do you decide what goes in? Mm, I think I, I, I try to put things in that were not obvious to me when I was starting out or that I think people get confused by like hexadecimal, I think can be really a bit off putting at first. Cause you're like, why are there these letters in my numbers? You know, like six F surely isn't a number. <laughs> um, and I wanted to explain why we use hexadecimal. Uh, Cause I think it's, I think often that's not made clear. Like people are like, Oh, we do this. I'm like, but it's like, why, why, why do we do it? Um, right. Uh, and, and with with hexadecimal, I'd, I'd say it's because, like, let, let's say you're looking at a a, a bi- number in binary, uh, and like like a series of bits, and you want to write them down for for a human to read. Like, you could write them as as bits, uh, like zero one zero one, you know. And that that's like sort of in, intuitive. I think people, I think actually people have a, like a pretty. I feel, I feel like people feel better about binary than they do about hexadecimal is what I found the, with the beta readers. Like they're more comfortable with it, which I think is interesting. Um, but, but binary is sort of too big, right? And after like there's more than like I think eight zeros or ones in a row, like your eyes kind of glaze over and it's too much. And then if you write uh, some bits in, in 
decimal, that's cool. And like, it's very human readable. And if it is an integer, that's great. Um, but then you have no idea what that corresponds to in terms of bits, right? Um, but then in hexadecimal, uh, four bits is one hexadecimal digit. Um, so there's this like really beautiful correspondence uh, where you can, it's very easy to tell. I think the on. real reason we work with hexadecimal is because there are bytes. And if we do four bits, we can call them nibbles. <laughs> and it's always fun to think of nibbles. It's so cute. It's funny because the, the four bits corresponding to a digit thing did not occur to me until I had been a professional for an embarrassingly long time. Mm. Yeah. And once once I got that, it was like, oh, oh, <laughs> this is this isn't that big a deal. But uh that 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 little bit of knowledge sinking in was was kind of what because I could always work with hexadecimal, but it was, you know, it's like, oh, I'll throw this at a calculator or something, you know, uh, instead of being able to kind of, uh, in my head, do some things. Yeah. And I think it's so important to tell people like the why, you know, because then like you can just think about the thing. Yeah. I mean, I guess I discovered that because I, I tend to write out registers in binary mm. and then hex. And so with hex, you in binary, I can, you know, write them real small and then I'll put a hex digit over them right. and then I can map them. But it's obvious when you write it out. Yeah. A lot. Like if you're doing the conversion by hand, then it's very clear what's going on. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think I didn't encounter that that much in my early career when I was doing internet protocol stuff because everything was like, well, who needs to break down a, a byte of a IPv4 address. Into, yeah, that makes sense. And nibbles doesn't doesn't matter. And yet, IPv4 and display color display are both areas where hexadecimal is something you see a lot. I mean, not a huge amount, but we mask the IPv6 numbers. Mm -hmm. You know, ff. Yeah, ff. They were, dot ff. Dot yeah, zero. Yeah, they were always masked on either byte wide boundaries or something horribly not byte wide. So it was never, you know, it's like. <laughs> yeah. And we see them in colors all the time. Yeah. Uh, RGB. And, and then you get FF, OO, FF. And you're like, oh, look, there's. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. HTML made designers have to learn that stuff because that's, you know. So talk about cruel and unusual punishments. <laughs> but uh, I, I don't think, I don't think anyone, are people bothered by hex colors? My, my impression is that. People feel fine about hex colors. And I am bothered by uh, two things about hex colors. 16-bit color, mm. <laughs> which is five, six, five, five, five bits of red, five bits of green, five bits of blue. or five Usually. Bits of, five bits of green, six bits of... God. Five <laughs> red, six green, five blue. Oh, wow. Um, so that's, that's a nightmare, especially when you're trying to convert back and forth between... A, you know, 24 bits of color to, to yeah. 16. Uh, and then byte ordering is a pain mm -hmm. in the butt. Mm -hmm. no, cause sometimes some stuff will be BGR instead of RGB or. Yeah. And that always hits me in machine learning applications. That there's something yeah, about you're trained on TensorFlow BGR and, <laughs> and C, uh, open CV. Open CV. And I always get bitten by that one. Mm, do, do they use 16-bit uh, colors a lot in machine learning? No, no. but they use different uh, encodings. Uh, different, different, orders. different byte orders, I see. Um, that's interesting. I wonder why. I think with the HTML colors, people just learn the, the 15 numbers, yeah. they need. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's yeah. easier now than it was. But. Yeah. Like in VS Code, if you type one of those and it knows you're in HTML, it'll, it'll color the, you know, if you type pound six six five one one whatever, it'll change that string to the color you've typed in. Really? Yeah. Let's try. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Julia, where did you learn the things you were putting into the zine? Is this a Wikipedia troll or a book or something else? Crowdsourced. I think the, definitely some crowdsourcing. Um, like, for example, when I was trying to understand, I was, I was trying to think about signed and unsigned integers. Um, and I kind of asked, like, you know, do you really need to know how signed integers work? 
Um, and I actually didn't really know how they worked at the time. And then someone, actually, S- Stefan Karpinski, who uh, co-created the Julia programming language and who was the person who taught me how Floating Point worked, he, he, he gave a talk at it that I saw 10 years ago, um, tweeted at me and explained in one tweet how sign signatures work. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, wow, I get it now. Thank you. <laughs> um, Wait, did the tweet include how twos complement works? Because... It did. <laughs> Cool. <laughs> it was a good. I need to see that. Good, it was a good tweet. Um, we could talk about choose compliment. Uh, sure. Tell me about choose compliment. I will remember it for approximately twelve minutes. All right, <laughs> and then right. we can talk about it all over again. Let let let's see if we can if we can get anywhere with choose compliment. <laughs> I re- I really felt the same way, but now I feel better about it. I'm um, post this tweet. So let, let, let's see. Um, okay, so let, let's talk about that eight bit integers, right? That go from zero to two fifty five because that's um, they're small and easy, yes, easy, easy to think easier. about. Um, uh, so so when you uh, add, uh, let's say you add one to two fifty five, right? Um, the way uh, that, that that generally works, like if you like run like the x86 like add instruction, is two fifty five plus one is zero, right? It'll, it'll roll back around to zero, right? And if you're lucky, you get a register that says you had a carryover. But... That's right. That's right. Right. Which you could either, you know, like in in your code, you could choose to to notice or ignore or whatever your code wants to do. And different programming languages will take different approaches to that. Um, but all that aside. Let's say it just rolls over. Um, and, and so if 255 plus 1 is 0, uh, an- another way to think about that is that 255 is equal to minus 1, right? Because uh, minus 1 plus 1 is 0. Okay, I like this. Um, and so uh, because of that, uh, 255 and minus 1 are represented the same way um, as, as numbers, right? So in unsigned integers, uh, 255 like the, the bytes like, you know, FF or 255. And then if it's signed, uh, those, those same bytes mean minus one um, because those two numbers uh, act the same way um, when, when you add them together. I, I'm, I'm liking this because I understand how a processor can not care about this. Right, right. Because it doesn't know what you mean by the bytes FF, you know. It's just no, like, it just it just adds one, and it doesn't care whether you have two fifty five or minus one. Right, right, because th- those are actually the same. Um, so that's that's two's complement, um, and then like two fifty four is the same as minus two, two fifty three is the same as minus three, etc. Um, until you get back to I think one twenty eight becomes minus one twenty eight, and then. So, so the numbers kind of above 128 uh, become negative w- when you think about them as signed. And then the, the smaller numbers from 0 to 127 are stay positive, um, if that makes sense. I have to think about this. This, this actually really works. It mind-bendingly works. <laughs> it's weird. It's weird. Um, but I, I think it's nice to think about it as, a, as kind of a way to make your computer's math really efficient, right? So that the, like, you only need to implement one set of hardware for adding positive and negative numbers. Right, right. Huh. That's not in your zine. It is. It is, and I just haven't seen it. It's on page eight. Ooh, unsigned versus signed integers. Oh, and there's a little circle. Mm Mm-hmm, there's a little circle. Oh, it's a good representation, yeah. Okay, so let's Go back to the business of scenes and get away from numbers for a few minutes while <laughs> my brain tries to to deal with its new form of two's complement. Um, you sell these. I do. That's right. How much do they usually cost? Uh, they are $12 for the PDF and $16 if you want a printed copy. And how did you decide on the price and the that you were going to sell them instead of just giving them away for free? Mm, I think the price was a little bit, I don't know, I picked something and seemed fine. Uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> That's how price is working. In terms of selling them, the, 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 that was a bit hard for me. But I guess... Because you didn't initially. Initially, you gave away a few. 
I did. I, I gave them all away. And then I started saying, okay, like, you can buy them. You can get like an early access version, like you can pay for early access. And then afterwards I'll make them free. And then I thought, you know, what if I didn't just didn't make them free and I just charged for them. And I felt kind of bad about doing that, but actually it was fine. And I don't know. It, it was just fine. Um, that's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and what, what do you know, like what sorts of people are buying them? Are they people who are, educators or people who are people who are kind of students themselves or do you have any sense of like who is most interested in buying them i think i i I write them for people who are who are working programmers um i think uh students and educators do buy them but that's not who i write them for um like or that's not who i have in mind if that makes sense um i I write them for anyone who who wants them um Uh, and I, I think like a lot of the time I assume that people have been using and working with these things already. Um, now that they're reading about it, if that makes sense. Like, so I like, I kind of assume that like, you've been, you know, you've used an integer, maybe you've noticed something weird about it. You've been using floating point numbers and now you're like, okay, what's going on with this? Right. Like I, my, my previous, uh, zine was about DNS and my assumption when writing that scene is that, you know, you've used a DNS, you've set up a website with it, um, and now you want to know what's actually going on behind the scenes. Uh, so so that, that, that's who I think of what I think of who I'm writing for. And you do have some free ones. I actually think that this profiling and tracing with Perf may have been the one we talked about when you were on the show. Oh, yeah. 300 episodes ago. <laughs> um that's that that's possible that one is free yeah but all of my earlier ones are free i think like the first six or seven that i published are free and then the, the ones after that are not free that's how it works your art style is disarmingly simple <laughs> um it's it's also uh the pinnacle of my artistic abilities i just do my best to draw and that that is my best <laughs> As you work on this full time, do you do you think more about I'm going to do more fancy art? I mean, some of your covers are are much fancier than the insides, which I totally I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, well, the the, the covers I, I pay an illustrator to draw, which is why they're like I don't draw them. Okay, <laughs> that, that that's why they're they contain art skills. Do you feel the pressure to improve your art skills or? Is this approachability the way you want it to be? Um, I, I don't feel pressure to improve my art skills. Um, I think I also, it's not something that I'm super interested in. Um, I feel a lot of pressure to ex- improve my uh, explanatory skills. Like, I think what I worry about is if someone reads a zine and it's like, I don't understand this. Like, that, 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 that stresses me out. And I, I definitely feel pressure to make things more clear. Um, I also, uh, feel pressure to improve my design skills. I think cause design is really important to, to clarity, right? So there's like questions of like how I lay out the page, um, how I lay out a diagram, um, how, how to make sure that, that, that it's clear and it's like easy to read. Um, but no, I, I don't think about my, my art skills, I would say almost at all. And I don't think that they've improved. I think my design skills have improved a lot, but not my art skills, if that makes sense. I would disagree a little bit. I think your art skills have gotten a bit better, but uh, I will. That's fair. I, I don't think that that's critical because there is an, like XKCD, there is an advantage to making it clear and simple and not trying to make it lifelike because you, what you're trying to do is pull out the information that's useful, not try yeah. to pull out all the information. Well, you also don't want something that's going to you want something that's immediately the simple art style suggests this is understandable before anything happens. And yeah. I think that's appropriate. Yeah. I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. It works. I think, I think the best compliment I ever got on my art is someone said, it looks like, you know how to draw and you've chosen not to, uh, <laughs> <laughs> which I really appreciated because that's not the case. <laughs> uh, and let's see, you also do, have your comics for free so so people can look up pages on css variables or curl yeah. or ooh floating point mm-hmm. 
That's think, different than what you have now. The thing I like about these is you can both learn from them. And if you already understand the concept, the way you've explained a lot of these things is from a different angle than people have learned them. Mm. Uh, and they're also great references to go back to like, oh, I can't really remember how, like the news compliment thing, <laughs> which I, you know, like Alicia said, I'm constantly forgetting how that works, even though I implemented a complete CPU emulator at one point mm -hmm. for work and, and had to know it backwards and forwards. After five years of not working with it closely, it's like, oh, that thing again. But having these be simple and, and fun to read and quick to look at kind of rekindles knowledge I used to have about the networking stuff too, because I used mm. to do a ton of networking and reading your networking scenes has been great because it's like, oh yeah, right, okay. <laughs> this is how, you know, TCP works or the basics of TCP and stuff like that. Um, so I think I think they're they're useful in a variety of ways, which is really cool. Yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm looking at the top comic and I'm like, I remember the last time I had to really use top for more than just which 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 process, process is blowing is up dead. your computer? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. And yeah, okay. These this was the information I needed and it took me like 20 minutes with the man page. <laughs> that that that's the dream. Yeah, I should replace man pages with these. <laughs> I don't know. They 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 uh, they leave out a lot. <laughs> yes, that's true. In the outline that I send most guests, there's a misc section at the bottom that we almost never get to. Like, mm. how did you get to this career? And there's one that says, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I almost never ask it. And you crossed it out as something you didn't want to have asked. <laughs> and so it would be incredibly rude of me to ask you, what do you want to be when you grow up? So I think I'm going to switch it to is this what you want to do? Is this, is this your plan? Are you formulating a evil lair with all kinds of other taking over the world prospects? And this is just your sideline. Uh, the, the, the reason I crossed it out is I don't really have plans. Um, I think I've never made plans that were long-term. So it's not, something that I've thought about. Like at some point my plan was like, oh, I want to work in machine learning. And then I did that. And then I was like, oh, maybe it would be fun to work in networking. And then I did that. And then I started doing this. And this, so this is what I'm doing. I don't know. I, I don't, I think I don't, I'm not, not a very like big brain person <laughs> or something. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's right, I don't, I just don't. Like, Your career sounds like mine in reverse without without comics, which maybe I should start. <laughs> uh, like like you, you you went from somewhere to, to networking to machine learning? I, yes, I, I did that's networking cool. and then embedded and then machine learning. Uh, and then I'm going back to machine learning. Nice. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, no, I, 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 I think there's, uh, m my problem is everything's exciting for a while and then something else is exciting. Yeah. <laughs> and then... I don't, I don't, yeah, getting stuck on stuff for a long time doesn't appeal to me. And then, and so making plans, you don't know what's going to appeal to you. So how could you make a plan? Yeah, that that's very much how I feel. That's fair. Do you, is there a dream job that somebody could call you up and say, okay, Julia, we are going to do machine learning on networking in space and we want <laughs> you to be the person to do it. <laughs> No. Would you? Are, okay. So you're not looking. This is this is what you want to be doing, at least for right now. Yeah, it, it is. I think like I, I always felt like I should have a dream job, if that makes sense. Like like a, sometimes I like look at, you know, like what jobs my friends have or what jobs like other maybe like fancy people out there have. And I'm like, oh, do I want to have that job? But the answer, it turns out, is usually no. I don't know. <laughs> like I like I, I think I found it surprisingly hard to find a, a, a dream job, if that makes sense. And I, I definitely don't have one. How did you decide it was safe to quit your engineering job? Mm, well, I was making enough money with the zines that that was enough for me to live on. And so it seemed pretty simple. I think like people often think about like running a business as being like a risky thing, but I'm not like a risk taker. Um, it, I was just like, this is working. So I guess I could do this. Was it a lot of fun to quit with that is the reason? Uh, no. 
<laughs> it's a weird answer. It was fine. There was no take this job and shove it moment, huh? Well, I, I'd been working there for a while, so I was a bit tired. So I think I was more just a bit tired at that point. You've also kept up your blog, which is often quite detailed. Mm. Is yeah. that part of writing the comics? I mean, that that's free, so that's... It, 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 it is part of it. I think a lot of the time I, I'll, I'll work out things that I'm trying to think about uh, when in the blog. Uh, and I can write, like the problem with the comics is there's not room for a lot of words. Um, so, so blogging is easier because I can write more words, right, to, to talk about a thing. And I'm not limited to like 200 words. Um, and I can sort of go off on tangents. Um, so I, I find it kind of a, a fun way to, to write about something that, and, and even that's some, sometimes tangential like what, what, what did I write about? I wrote about like what, what's weird about floating point numbers. Like I, I have a, a page in the zine that talks about like what can go wrong when using floating point numbers. And I also wrote it, which is like 200 words. And then I also wrote like maybe like a 1500 word blog post about it. That kind of, then I like later condensed. Right. And I was like, okay, how can we talk about this very briefly? So yeah, I, I often expand on things. And sometimes I write about things on the blog that don't make it into the zine at all. Like I talked about, uh, why a byte is eight bits on the blog, um, which isn't in the scene at all. Why are there eight bits in a byte? Um, what I gathered, it's there's a lot of history, and I'm not really a computer history person, I've got to admit. Um, but I think the very short version is that uh, it's about text processing. Um, so let's say you want a, an English character. I think it's also important here that you're American, right? So like, let's say you're, you're inventing, you're working at IBM and you're American and the English alphabet has 26, uh, 26 or like characters. Then you have like the, the uppercase one. So you're at like 52. Um, so. And, and then the numbers you, and the punctuation. So you get to like 93 or 96. You get to like 93, right? So you need at least seven bits, but like, it's probably weird to have a, an, an odd number of, of bits in your byte. So then I, I guess you do eight. Um, I, I don't think that's like totally historical, but they, they, they do, did talk a lot about how they wanted to prioritize text processing um, and, and having a byte size that made sense for text processing. Also, also you don't want your, your bytes to be too big because at some point you're going to be wasting space, right? Um, yeah, so that, 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 that's how I think about it. Uh, the the blog post is is longer than that, but it really is. <laughs> that's the summary. Binary yeah. coded decimal too. Oh my god. Oh yeah. god, <laughs> not binary coded decimal. No, not binary <laughs> coded decimal. <laughs> we don't need to talk about that. <laughs> Did you, when you had a, a full time job, were you finding topics for for zines and blog posts based on stuff you were doing, or and is, is yeah. The, the finding of topics different now that you don't have that job and are maybe not encountering stuff in the same way. Yeah, it is different. Like what, what, what did I write about? Like, for example, I wrote help. I had to have a manager cause I felt confused right. about how to have a manager. <laughs> um, and then I figured some things out. Well, I had a very good manager and then I, I learned some things from him. And so I wrote a zine about that. Um, what, what, what else, what else did I write about? Um, and then now, I think I, I, I work on different things. So I wrote a zine about CSS more recently, maybe a couple of years ago, because I started making more websites uh, to go with the zines. And uh, and then I was working with someone who was extremely good at CSS. And I learned from her uh, that it's possible to write CSS and it's possible to understand it. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Which is something it's that I had. It's not a black box. It's not a black box. Like it's, it's simply quite hard. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> uh, actually, a lot of things are quite hard, and you can learn all of them. So, um, and that 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 was huge for me. Um, so, so so I wrote about that. Um, I, I I forget what else I wrote about when when I had a job. Uh, I don't know. Um, and then what, like, for the best, you can forget all about it. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then now I, I think it, I also have more space to go back to more fundamental topics. Like it's quite yeah. hard for me to write about how floating point works. I think because I, it's something I learned a long time ago. Like it's easier for me to learn about things that I learned. It's easier for, for me to write about things I learned more recently. Um, and I learned about floating point maybe like 
10 years ago at this point. And so it's hard to go back and be like, okay, like how can I explain this to someone who's coming to it for the first time? And how can I make it really clear? And that I think is something I didn't have the time or space to do when I had a job. And now I, I do have the time to do that. Do you take requests? Uh, I take suggestions. Yeah. I, I don't know. I'm always interested to hear what, what people want. I, I almost never listen, but I'm, or I, like, I almost <laughs> never do them, but I always love to hear them. <laughs> what do you want, Christopher? Uh, public key encryption. Oh. Unless you haven't, I've already done no, it. No, I, I haven't. It's funny. I was thinking about that this morning for some reason. <laughs> it might, it might, you never know. Um, that's another math one, right? Um, yes. <laughs> um, yeah. Ma- math ones are always hard for me, but I'm, get, I'm getting better at it um, because I, I did a math degree, and so I always want to give, like, an extremely math jargony explanation. I'm like, well, you know, like, <laughs> um, and so it, it takes a lot of work for me to write about math stuff in a way that's accessible to everyone. Could have gotten into countable and uncountable infinities and in, in <laughs> floating point. <laughs> Cardinality. <laughs> yeah, but pu- public key encryption, it could be cool. It's, it's pretty important. And it depends on whether you're writing from a... I want to understand this because I have to implement something or I want to understand this because I want to be able to use it effectively. Yeah. Or to understand when people write about it, what they're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. I'm I'm always looking for ways. I feel like with public key encryption, what would be tricky for me is people often use, like when people are trying to um, not get too mathy with it, they often use uh, metaphors. Like, I don't know. I don't really know what the metaphors are, but they always feel a little bit off to me or a bit confusing to me. So I always want to figure out how to talk about the thing in a more direct way, like to talk about what it actually is and saying like, oh, this is something that it's like, Um, but without getting, without kind of requiring like too much like prior knowledge or or jargon. So it's tricky. Mm -hmm. Metaphors are hard. Yeah, they're very hard. They're like, sorry. (laughs) (laughs) That's a simile. (laughs) Um. Your blog covers more than a decade. Do you ever reread the old ones? I do sometimes. I think I actually feel very positive about my past work almost all the time. Like I'll look at something I wrote and I'm like, wow, that's cool. <laughs> Does it ever feel like somebody else wrote it? Uh, no, I, I remember that person. <laughs> I'm working on a second edition of my book and I swear somebody else wrote many of these jokes because I was never that funny. <laughs> I do often think I'm, I, I'm like, I'm not that funny. <laughs> like, it's true. I always feel like someone who was a little funnier than me wrote them. <laughs> I have a, a mundane, boring co- process question to ask you, but I'm curious. So I'm going to ask it. Yeah. Uh, how do you draw? Like, what do you use to draw your, your zines? Do you write them on paper and then scan them in? Or do you have you know, a pen tablet and pen and Photoshop or I use an iPad. Um, okay. With the, I use this app called affinity designer, uh, which is like a vector drawing app. I think I, it's like maybe a bit complicated. I, I definitely grew into it. I started out using much simpler apps and then ended up deciding to use something more complicated. You can use affinity to do the, to do what you've done. Yeah. I use yeah. affinity a little bit. But it's all vector things as I'm working on origami, and it's super frustrating. <laughs> well, I, I use the pencil tool, you know, like I just draw. Um, I, I, I don't I use the, that. like, I don't look at, like, the Bezier curves or anything. I, I just use the pencil tool. Fair. Okay. Yeah, it just makes a list of millions and millions of curves. It can do it. It does. It does make a list of millions and millions of curves. <laughs> One of the other things I saw on your website were uh playgrounds that's right Could you describe those oh yeah yeah oh yeah those are okay so when i make because like I, I write these zines right but like the way that you learn about computers the way that i learn about computers isn't to read about them you know <laughs> like the way we, we learn about uh computers is, is to use them um and to like poke at them and to break them um and so but i want to I've gotten really into making these interactive playgrounds to go with the zines where you can play around with the thing. I think my favorite one is for the DNS zine. Um, I was talking to people about DNS and people were like, I don't want to just mess around with my website's DNS. So I'm going to break it. And I was like, oh yeah. Like, cause like I do like mess around with my website. Like, I, I don't know. I think because I understand DNS pretty well, I'm always uh, 
like I'm not scared I'm gonna break it I'll, so I'll just do whatever um like I'll make some subdomain like asdf.gemins.ca and I'll just kind of play around but obviously it's reasonable that people are scared about messing with their dns um and so i was like well i'll make a, a website it's called messwithdns.com where people could mess with my website's dns <laughs> um and and kind of and do experiments and and play around um this scene has a a, a website a playground called Memory Spy, where you can write a little C program, which has maybe some integers or some floats, and you can click on the code and see what the like what's in memory. It, it'll it'll you'll 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 put the program um, in the web interface, and then it'll run it, and then it'll like put it through like a C debugger, and then it'll show you what's in memory in that program. Um, it's basically GDB. I mean, it is it 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 is GDB behind the scenes, but uh, GDB, as you probably know, is a can be intimidating if you're not used to it. So I, I made it cute and, I don't know, not so, not so confusing. So that, that's called memory spy. I wish these things existed when I was learning. <laughs> <laughs> then there was just books and the Apple II ROM monitor. <laughs> <laughs> Did not have ways of seeing floating point easily. <laughs> Yeah, and then there's also this website, um, which which I did not make, called float.exposed, which shows you all the little pieces of a floating point number, um, which I which I reference in the zine because um, it's incredible. I I didn't I see that Memory Spy was in the zine um, along with a couple other things, float.exposed and integer.exposed. Yeah, um, but I had actually been playing with the playgrounds that were under your experiments tab oh yeah that's right those are the yeah yeah these are the 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 free ones that you you expose for for people to play with those are for other zines i guess oh okay um i haven't put these ones up yet they're also i mean they're all free but i just haven't got around to updating that that section of the website are there what are you going to work on after you finish floating points I don't know. I, I never. I never know what I'm going to work on next. Uh, and when I think I do, I'm usually wrong. So I can tell you what I think I might work on, and then it'll be wrong. So that's fine. Um, I was thinking about. So I, I'm not a C programmer, uh, unlike unlike you folks. Um, I've, I've never written a, a real C program, and I. But but I love C in a way. Like I, I love. Uh, like I, I feel like knowing a little bit of C teaches you so much about how your computer works. And it's been so important for me to understand like just, just a little bit of C. And so I kind of, I want to write a guide to C maybe for people who have never, uh, who never intend to write C in their lives. Um, so that you can do things like maybe like compile <laughs> C programs or like implement bindings to a C program, you know, like mm-hmm. in the programming language you actually want to use or like understand like Linux system calls and like what like the interface to those is. Um, so that that's something I'm thinking about. What about one that's just about pointers? Mm, I don't know. Always trying to get people to do pointers <laughs> because people get so confused by them. Yeah, uh, I, I I I probably need to think about. I don't know if I have anything. I I, I don't know what's confusing about pointers yet. Like I mean, I know I know I know I, I haven't figured. I think I I probably need to think about that for a long time to see if I can say anything about pointers that's useful. I think pointers as a, as a, as an abstract concept are not difficult. Pointers in C can be quite difficult because of the way C does things. Yeah. It just have little star guys. <laughs> you have little star guys, but, but what happens when you plus one of the, of that? Well, it's not like you can so just move by a byte or four bytes or eight bytes or 32 bytes or. Depends on where you put the parentheses. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and, and I feel like that's the kind of thing that I probably wouldn't. I feel like that's only relevant when you're really writing C programs, if that makes yeah. sense. Um, which obviously is very important for people who write C programs. Uh, but that isn't me. But it's not for everyone. You had a question for us that you put into the notes. Do you I want did. to ask it? I would love to ask it. Let me remind myself of what it was. Um I guess I was curious about what uh, issues you run into with math on embedded systems. Um, like, are there 
do you have systems which don't have floating point numbers? Yes. Yes, but less frequently. Less frequently? Well, Starting with the super the low power. M, the M0s don't. Right. But, so yeah. So the low power ones don't. and But the M4 sort of took over where the M3 was, and the M4 has good floating point. But just because you don't have floating point doesn't mean you can't use floating point. <laughs> it just means you have to pull in a library that's very slow. And you do it all in software. Yeah. Right. And there is this thing called Q numbers, which yeah. are basically floating point implementation in software, but you do it with knowledge of what's happening. You don't let the compiler hide what's happening. If you want to add two Q numbers together, you know that there's an exponent it's, yeah, and that there's the, the, the regular digits. It's fixed point. It, it's mm, fixed point. It's so fixed point. You multiply up by whatever precision you want to have, and then you know when mm. you have to divide it back down to pr print it or something like that. But Q numbers will actually let you change where yeah, your fixed point is. But, but I rarely do. <laughs> I rarely do that. It's like when I'm, when I need to use fixed point, it's like, okay, I need, I have this range of things like I'm doing some where I mostly encounter was graphics. Like I don't have floating point or I don't want to use even floating point on a, a chip with an FPU is sometimes pretty slow. Um, so if I want stuff to go fast, but I still need kind of decimal numbers, then multiply up by 16 or something like that. And that gives me the precision I need for like some stupid pixel operation, like drawing a circle or something. And so you multiply all your numbers by 16 and now you have a lot more granularity mm -hmm. instead of just having between zero and one, you have 16 numbers, <laughs> one number, yeah. usually in an integer. Yeah. But if you multiply by 16, then you have a whole bunch num of numbers between zero and one. Yeah. And fi fixed point is really important outside embedded too. Um, like if you're representing money, I think a lot of the time you, you want to use fixed point and be like, okay, we're going to have an integer number of cents, you know, or like micro cents or something. Yeah. There's big issues with people using Excel for, um, for financial stuff. Right. And it, it does floating point by default or something and money just kind of disappears or appears. Yeah. It doesn't exist because of the issues we talked about with yeah, floating point. Because of the random I mean, issues. Was, wasn't Superman. That's Superman 4. Three? And, and we'll just take all of the extra tenths of pennies and rule the world <laughs> from ATM machines. I don't remember the actual scheme, but yes. I just remember that a few years after that movie came out, I came out with that as an idea myself, not realizing I was referencing. I think it was also the Planet Office space. I, it, yeah. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> yes. Um, that doesn't work because other people have thought of it. Uh, and yet it does kind of work because... So many people do still use Excel for financial things. Mm. Uh, let's see. Uh, the other part of your question is, are there operations that are slow? Oh, yeah. Like, is, <laughs> is, 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 is division slow? That was yeah. my question. So slow. Yeah. <laughs> so you want to avoid that, too, and which, which can be helped by... Multiplying, multiplying by... by <laughs> <laughs> Need to divide by eight? Okay, we can do that. We need to divide by nine. <laughs> mm, How about so we divide much. by eight and then kind of wave our magic wand? Yeah, division is is a big problem. <laughs> Modulo mm. also because it's division. Yeah, right. Unless you're do, you know doing a power of two, which which is fast. But yeah, those those little chips they've gotten a lot better, but there's still a lot of and the C libraries that support floating point have gotten a lot better than they used to be. Oh, interesting. You know, it's still terrible. But it is still terrible, yes. So, so, something that I think is interesting about software implementations of floating point is that we have those outside of embedded too, like their decimal floating point. Uh, like like right. Python has, has, a, has, a, has a decimal floating point implementation that's in software that uses like a base 10 floating point um, that's better, huh. better for money, which is, which is interesting. To look for that. Not that I would use it, but I want to look at it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, ha I haven't looked at it closely. What are the ramifications of that? Maybe I don't understand. So it's that, um, like, so, so, so the numbers that are rep representable exactly in, in floating point are sort of things that are like powers of two, right? So like you have like a half or like three quarters, three quarters, yeah. Um, you can represent exactly in, in, in floating point. Um, 
but you can't represent like one tenth exactly, right? Because that, that's not something that's uh, like representable exactly in base two. It's like a repeating decimal. Um, but you can have a decimal floating point where things that are even, uh, even fract- like one tenth are representable exactly. Um, so it's it's like a different different. It's a different way to structure which 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 samples you take of of the log uh, base ten. That's how bases <laughs> work. <laughs> yes. I know, but as we're talking about this, we don't necessarily yeah. go back to to logarithms. Yeah. Yeah. The solution, of course, is to switch our money to base hexadecimal two. money. <laughs> to base two. <laughs> give me give me F dollars. Uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think Julia's going for this. <laughs> thought <laughs> well i think um i think we should be letting you go do you have any thoughts you'd like to leave us with julia what i thought was fun about being on this podcast is that uh like the way we re- we all relate to like for example numbers is so different based on our work you know like like i feel like the the relationship you have with uh, like floating point and like the side line, like what size of number is reasonable is so different and embedded than it is like in my experience of computers. And I just think that that's fun. Our guest has been Julia Evans, creator of Wizard Zines. That's wizardzines.com. Thanks, Julia. Thanks so much for having me. This has been so fun. Thank you to Christopher for producing and co-hosting. Thank you to our Patreon listener Slack group for some of their questions. And thank you for listening. Don't forget that Volta Labs has a job opening for you. Check out the show notes for that. And now, thought to leave you with. 30 centimeters of wire. These wires represent the distance an electrical signal travels in a nanosecond. One billionth of a second. And Admiral Grace Murray Hopper started distributing them in the late 60s to demonstrate how designing smaller components would produce faster computers. Go carry a nanosecond around with you.